Like I said, it's 12.4. Welcome to lesson 12.4, a self-sufficient country. How did Japan's self-sufficiency contribute to their unique Japanese worldview? So stick around and let's learn something. Lesson 12.4 is all about self-sufficiency. In this lesson, we will learn how Japan's self-sufficiency contributed contributed to the Japanese worldview. When a country is self-sufficient, that means it doesn't have to rely on any other countries. It does not have to be uh, dependent on any other countries to receive any things, any goods or any resources. They can do everything on their own. Your parents, trust me, your parents want you to become self-sufficient individuals where you are able to do everything on your own. True story. Go ask them. All right. What we know in the history of Japan so far from any opening activities and class discussions that we had, we know that Japan had very little trade with other countries before the year 1853. Now, if we relate that to the history of Canada that we know from previous grades, 1853 Canada, like we're, we're getting ready to um, create the dominion of Canada. And we have been trading with other colonies and other countries, and there's been all kinds of wars taking place. But on the other part of the world, in Japan's story, no trade was happening at this time. But somehow, Japan still survived. And in fact, not only did they survive, they prospered as well. And a lot of that has to do with their resources and their climate. So if we take a look at, um, at sustenance, let's say, for example, the farmers and the fishers that are in Japan, they are going to be providing food for all of the people. Okay, so you've got that people can eat. We've got some farms, we've got we've got the oceans there. Obviously, it's an island. So that's going to be okay. We have forests for supplying the wood that we're going to need to build our homes, we can burn it for fuel. We've got silkworms and cotton plants in Japan, so that's going to allow people to get clothing. Then we have metals as well, and artists are going to use those metals, and they, you know, it's self-sufficient. They're not getting these things from other countries. Now it's an island. We know it's an island, and um, the. Majority of Japan, the soil is not uh, very good. Okay, so the land that was suitable was extremely fertile. Although there wasn't a lot, the the land that they did have access to very fertile. So we had a good climate, uh, excellent amounts of rain, a very short winter, which means you're going to have a long growing season. And it's going to allow them to farm the crops that they need to be a self-sufficient country. And what do you think is going to be their main crop, their main staple in their diet? Well, if you're thinking rice, you would be right. So rice and uh, seafood, actually. So sushi is going to be important, too. But uh, rice is going to be their staple. But rice is not an easy thing to grow. It is very labor intensive and it actually depends on quite a bit of rainfall. So we need monsoons. We need those winds. We need that moisture to be brought to these rice farms to be able to grow this rice. So you're very dependent on that. And like we've seen in other histories of the world, um, the spices of, the, of, of Europe and the cocoa bean of the Aztecs rice in Japan is eventually used as a monetary system. And the value of your land is how much rice it could produce. So for example, we take a look now. And we take a look at land values here in Edmonton, uh, a top apartment in the ice district is going to be extremely important and very expensive for us. But from a Japanese point of view back during this time in their history, that would be a useless piece of land because it doesn't produce anything, it doesn't produce any rice. Now, our times have changed and we take different 
uh, things into account when we determine land value. But for Japan back then, definitely how much rice a piece of land could produce will determine its value. And its worth, your worth as a Japanese person, is determined by rice production. A large rank and wealth is directly related to the production of rice. So we see this again. We saw this with uh, the with with pepper, and we saw this with the cocoa bean as well. I also mentioned sushi as well, seafood, and the sea, the food that was provided, was also central to the Japanese way of life because it provided Japanese people with that protein that is needed. And they also they ate seaweed because of the uh, high vitamin content and minerals. Soy was also an important part of Japanese diet and lifestyle. And if you go to a Japanese restaurant today, it's very common. You have your sushi, you've got rice uh, with the um, salmon or the tuna or whatever is on top wrapped in seaweed and you dip it in soy sauce, right? So uh, we see today that even as Canadians, we've kind of adapted and adopted the Japanese diet for some of us anyways. Now, I want to take a look at the homogenous society that exists in Japan. Many countries obviously have distinct cultures. They themselves will have cultures that are distinct inside their own countries too. Think of Canada, for example. Do we have a Canadian culture? It's a tough question to answer, isn't it? Can we define a Canadian? It's also a tough thing. We have many, many cultures within our own country, just like many other countries do. But Japan, on the other hand, is a homogenous society, which means that the people all have a similar nature, they have a similar character, and they share similar values and beliefs. Unlike some of the other countries like Canada, for example, where we do have different characters, different values, different beliefs, different religions, right? And for Japan, it's a homogenous society. In Canada, we are a multicultural society. In Japan, because of the ruggedness of the island, most of the population is going to live along the coast. So they have that in common. So that means being by the coast, you're going to rely on the sea for quite a bit. So the sea is going to provide them with communication and a trading center for them. And it will allow them to exchange their ideas, their beliefs, values, and goods using those sea routes. And remember, they're homogenous, so they're all the same. So they're going to have those things in common. You can see on the graphic that I have here, and this is a breakdown of the um, people who live within these areas. So in Asia, for example, 81.6% of the people living in Asia are of Asian descent, Asian cultures, okay? But you can see that 4.2% of the Asian population is European African or uh, not identified. 11.2 are South Americans and 3% of all of the people living in Asia are North American. Compare that to Japan, 98.3% of the population in Japan is Japanese whereas only 1.7% of the population are going to be foreign residents. Like Canada, Japan also has a very distinct group of people. The Ainu, and we've talked about this before. These are Canada's indigenous people. We talked about this in the last lesson, and they lived in the north and live in the northern part of Japan, where they had their own separate society and they had their own territory. But very similar to our Canadian history, Japan begins to take over the land belonging to the Ainu. Like what happened in American history and in Canadian history, the Ainu resisted against the Japanese government. They fought wars against them, but ultimately they were defeated. And then over time, the Ainu territory uh, becomes a part of Japan. And then the Japanese begin their process of assimilation, which we have talked about in uh, previous years, like in grade seven, we talk about assimilation, what the Canadian government did to uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit people here in Canada. The Japanese were doing similar things to the Ainu in Japan. So what were some of those things? Well, they were forbidden to speak their own language. 
they were forbidden to practice their customs as well. We've seen that here in other uh, countries' histories too. The Ainu were restricted to live on government-provided areas. We've seen that happen before in other countries as well. And they were given land to farm even though they were not farmers. They were a hunting and fishing society. And guess what? We saw that happen to indigenous groups in other countries as well, where their traditional uh, way of living was changed and disrupted by the governments that were encroaching onto their territory. All right, I want you to head over to your notebook and complete the questions for this part of the chapter.